waiting for that ding. And there's the ding. We've talked about plankton. We've talked about nectin, the uh, third functional division of marine life is benthos, critters living on the bottom. And I'll kick this off with a cracking start by talking mostly about benthic photosynthetic organisms, uh, bacteria, archaea. There are eukaryotic single-celled algae and eukaryotic multi-celled algae, uh, namely the seaweeds. Uh, chlorophyta is green algae, and they also include the ancestors of land plants. And flat land plants really ought to be incorporated within the chlorophyta. Uh, rhodophyta is red seaweeds, and not that closely related to either one. Theophyta is brown algae, uh, kelps and things like that. As I mentioned, within the chlorophyta, the land plants are actually included. And most land plants are called land plants because they don't live in the ocean. Wow, that was profound. Uh, but of uh, vascular plants, you know, plants with water conducting tissue, uh, there's two in the oceans that are actually quite important, sea grasses and mangroves. So let's go ahead and march through the taxa. This is this doesn't look like much. This is a picture I took um, a several years ago when I went down to uh, South Padre Island at the southern tip of Texas, and it's what we call a barrier island. I'll, I'll talk about what that means in a bit, but it's one of these long, narrow islands that tend to build up parallel to coastlines, and. On the ocean side of the island, that's the beaches where everybody likes to go because there's waves breaking and sand and, you know, seashells and, you know, surf and um, all of that. On the opposite side of the island, there's a lagoon, a shallow area of salt water, um, not uh, readily accessible from the ocean, although there are some channels that link it up and you don't get any wave action. So with much quieter water and much less disturbance, what we observed is mats of, turned out to be mostly blue-green bacteria and single-celled eukaryotic algae. In fact, uh, quite a lot of diatoms, if memory serves. Uh, hang on, I just heard a ding-dong. Um, just growing there on the surface of the sand. All right. Um, okay, we've let somebody in. Um, okay, I tried. There we go. All right. Uh, so what we saw on the surface of the sand was this mat, uh, roughly the thickness of a nice thick piece of leather made up of blue-green bacteria and uh, single-celled eukaryotic algae, uh, mostly diatoms. And what you're looking at is, this doesn't look that exciting, but that's a place where we peeled off some of the mat. You could pull it off in strips, and that green, raggedy stuff right there, that's the edge of the mat, and it's green because it's made up of blue-green bacteria. So why was it growing there? Well, for one thing, there was no wave action, so there's nothing churning the sand up. For the other thing, that lagoon on the unfashionable side of South Padre Island, uh, the side without the hotels and the spring breakers getting drunk, that side of the island, because it's a lagoon, it's not very well connected with the open ocean, although there are some channels that do it. And that means the salinity tends to be greater on the lagoon side. And so there's not a great deal of animals to disturb the uh, development of the mat. In particular, there aren't any grazers. There's no snails or anything uh, that would churn up that mat and eat the algae. 
And so in habitats like that, um, you can get pretty extensive microbial mats building up on the uh, uh, on the on the bottom. Now you might recall that that, by the way, is not a colorized picture. You might recall that when you talk about prokaryotes, there's a whole group called bacteria, and and there's a second domain that biochemically is very different from bacteria uh, called the archaea. And this is an aerial view of the south end of San Francisco Bay. And it's owned by, I think it's Cargill, a uh, chemical company. And what they produce is salt. And they do it by, they've dug these ponds. Uh, each one of these colorful zones that you're seeing is actually a pond. And they'll open a channel into each pond and let it fill with seawater and then close up the channel and then just let the uh, seawater evaporate. Um, most of the year, there's not much rain. Uh, so the seawater just evaporates and what's left behind gets saltier and saltier. And it eventually gets so salty that the only thing that can live in this environment is photosynthetic archaea of species that are salt tolerant. And they're photosynthetic, but they don't use chlorophyll. They use different pigments. So these shallow evaporation ponds will go from green to yellow to orange to bright red, the saltier that they get. And that's what you're seeing. These are very shallow ponds. So this is basically benthic uh, mats of algae, of uh, archaea, sorry, not algae. And just one or a couple of species will dominate these ponds because they're too saline for anything else to live. Uh, so this is archaea forming these mats, dominating extreme environments because they have absolutely no competition. Incidentally, if you ever get to fly into San Francisco International Airport, if you're coming in from the east, uh, the plane usually flies over these and you can see them as you're making your final approach. Just in case we ever get to fly anywhere on airplanes ever again. Okay, right. This is a cross-section through another microbial mat. This one happens to be from Guerrero Negro in Baja, California. Uh, also a salt producing place. And uh, this is a vertical slice uh, through a microbial mat. And you can see different layers, uh, different species of bacteria growing at different depths. And it turns out that this microbial mat is among the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. What they've done is just taken mat samples, dropped them into a well, it's more complicated than that, but they basically just done random PCR and seen what kind of DNA sequences they can get out of these mats. And the estimate is that each mat might contain something like 10,000 species of bacteria in 40 different groups that are on the taxonomic level of a phylum. So there is an enormous amount of biodiversity going on in these mats. Hello, cat. Okay, so you don't see these in a lot of shallow water environments that, because the bacteria never get to build up mats like that. Uh, you tend to get mats today only in areas that are undisturbed and very saline. Um, before the evolution of large grazing animals, um, before about, oh, 550 million years ago, microbial mats were uh, predominant in many parts of the ocean. Uh, nowadays, not so much. Okay, this is clearly not a microbial mat. That's a seaweed. Um, seaweeds grow as multicellular bodies called thalli. Uh, so you're looking at a thallus. Seaweeds don't have vascular tissue. They don't have conducting cells that carry water or nutrients from one part of the plant to the other. And cell differentiation is present but limited. They don't have as many different types of cell uh, as a true land plant would. 
um, because they don't have the cell differentiation and structure, we don't call uh, leaves. Uh, the, uh, the blades uh, often grow from a stipe. That's the equivalent to a stem. And often the stem ends, or the stipe, ends at a holdfast. Uh, you're looking at the holdfast of a brown alga right there. Uh, that's not a true root system. It's not picking up uh, nutrients and conveying them to the rest of the seaweed. Uh, it's just there to grab onto the bottom, uh, to grab onto whatever the seaweed is attached to. So the stipe will often branch into one or more blades. Uh, the blades um, may bear pneumatocysts, uh, that's gas-filled bladders, uh, that'll help the thing stay upright in, in water. Uh, so all those spiky things right there, uh, that's just gas bladders. Seaweed species, like land plants, have cell walls, but they may contain a diverse number of other polysaccharides. Uh, one of them is called carrageenan, and you can find carrageenan a lot in processed foods because it's a thickening agent. Uh, there's several different uh, polysaccharides that are used in food uh, to provide thickness. Uh, so, for example, if you get some salad dressing, um, they may not include very much actual fat uh, or oil, partly because maybe it's diet salad dressing, but also partly because that may go rancid uh, if it's left around for too long. And, you know, these days the modern consumer demands salad dressing that could survive, you know, 3,000 years in an Egyptian tomb and still taste really good on your salad. So instead of fat, salad dressings are often thickened with various polysaccharides. Uh, one of them's derived from bacteria, one's derived from a bean, and one is carrageenan, uh, derived from this red seaweed, Chondrus crispus, uh, otherwise known as Irish moss. It's not really a moss, but it does grow a lot in Ireland. And um, People in coastal Ireland and Scotland and Iceland uh, have been known to eat it. It's related to the Japanese uh, seaweed called nori that you know if you've ever had sushi. It's the stuff they wrap your California roll in. But carrageenan is also added to a lot of processed foods. And different seaweeds also have different types of pigment. All eukaryotic algae contain a type of chlorophyll called chlorophyll B. Green algae have chlorophyll, sorry, chlorophyll A. Green algae also have chlorophyll B. And you might remember that there are two different photosystems in uh, land plants, right? Where, you know, one type of chlorophyll harvests some energy and uses it to excite an electron. And then that passes down an electron transport chain and then uh, goes to the second type of chlorophyll, uh, two different photosystems. Algae have different colors because in addition to chlorophyll, uh, they've got different accessory pigments that can capture light and pass it to chlorophyll. So green algae's got chlorophyll A and B. Red algae has chlorophyll A, D, and pigments called phycoerythrin and phycocyanin. Brown algae has chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C, and D, and a brown pigment called fucoxanthin. Now, I have no earthly idea why, but somebody is selling fucoxanthin as a dietary supplement. Uh, why it's got a pomegranate on the label, I don't know, because that stuff comes from brown algae. And I have no idea whether it does any good or not. Um, I suspect a lot of those supplements don't really. Um, but yeah, that was the best picture I could find to find an illustration of the accessory pigment, fucoxanthin. Uh, you can take it to support weight loss.
whatever that means. And the reason for all those pigments is that photosynthetic organisms absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect others, like anything that's got that anything that looks like it has a color to our eyes has that color because it's reflecting certain wavelengths and absorbing the rest. And the wavelengths of incident light used in photosynthesis make up what's called the action spectrum. So in green algae, uh, green plants and green seaweeds look green because they're absorbing red and blue. Chlorophyll B, that's that green curve, uh, you can see it's got an absorbance peak at about 470 nanometers and another one at about 650. It's absorbing light of those wavelengths and reflecting light in the middle. Um, so you see there's a very flat absorption spectrum between about 500 and maybe 625. Uh, that's all the light that the chlorophyll B is not absorbing. Um, instead, it's reflecting. And so it comes to our eyes and we perceive it as the color green. Chlorophyll A has two different peaks, but it also absorbs uh, strongly in the red and the blue and reflects the yellows and the greens. Phycoerythrin and phycocyanin, that's that red curve and that blue curve, and they absorb uh, blue, but they also absorb green. Phycocyanin absorbs a lot of blue. Phycoerythrin absorbs a lot of green. And they both reflect a lot of red, which is why red algae, which have that combination of pigments, red algae. Now, the deeper you go in water, the more light is absorbed and the darker it gets. And because light's absorbed as it passes through water, there's a trend for deeper water algae to look darker. That's a green alga, but you can see it's very dark green. Tips of it are almost starting to look black. And that's because deeper water algae, there's less light available, so they have to absorb more of what's there. So if they're absorbing more of what's there, they're reflecting less, and that means they're going to look darker. We'll come back to diagrams like this, but one of the things that's important for, to look at when you start looking at life in the ocean through depth is, first of all, life does, light does not penetrate um, all the way to the bottom, of course. Uh, once you get down much below 200 meters, even in very cl clear water, uh, you, you can't see anything. Um, it starts getting, you know, it starts getting very dark and it starts getting impractical for photosynthesis. But blue-green wavelengths penetrate more deeply than red. Uh, you can see red is pretty much completely absorbed uh, by the time you're about 50 meters down. So below that depth, well, you're still getting some blue, but it starts getting harder and harder if you're a green alga because you uh, you don't have red uh, you don't have red light to absorb. If you're a red alga, you're absorbing blue and green, and you'll do better at great depth. So red algae, uh, there are some that live in the shallows, but they tend to predominate at greater depths. And for example, here's some red algae from uh, the northern Gulf of Mexico. Pretty deep, but there are a few shallow spots. And this is one called McGrail Bank. Um, I'm seeing at least two different species of red seaweed. And kind of scattered among the uh, seaweeds, uh, that rocky bottom, uh, there's some, some of the pebbles on the bottom. Uh, look kind of purplish pink. Those are red seaweeds as well. They're a type called coralline algae because they secrete calcium carbonate. And so they look kind of like um, bumpy pink stones. Uh, but those are red algae as well. Quite a lot of them down pretty much at the close to the limit of photosynthesis.
Okay, seaweed life cycles vary a lot, but they generally include an alternation of generations. Uh, a large visible stage called a sporophyte that produces duh, spores. Uh, the spores grow into very small gametophytes, and the gametophyte is what produces sperm and egg. Uh, those fertilize to form zygotes, and the zygotes develop into new sporophytes. And it's the circle of life, right? Don't confuse seaweeds with sea grasses because sea grass is true flowering plants. They're in the monocots. Uh, they're not in the family of true grasses, uh, but they are in fact vascular plants and they've got leaves and veins and stems and all of that. And there's 58 known species. You get a lot of this in the Gulf of Mexico. The sandy beaches are where everybody wants wants to put their, you know, motels and all that, but there is a lot of seagrass habitat um, as well, and it's biologically very rich. There's lots of animals that are adapted to living on seagrass or around seagrass, sheltered by the seagrass, grazing on the seagrass. Um, one of the most important uh, habitats in, um, in the uh, temperate ocean, seagrass beds. The problem with living completely submerged in water is that it may be hard for oxygen to get to all parts of the plant. So seagrasses contain aerenchyma. Uh, this is a cross section through a seagrass leaf. And there's just open air spaces uh, that transmit and store oxygen that's produced by the photosynthetic tissues. So there's uh, special air channels inside seagrass for the transmission of oxygen. And in many places, they're important ecosystem engineers. Um, seagrass roots and seagrass rhizomes, uh, the you know, horizontal spreading stems uh, that they have, uh, stabilize the seabed, they keep it from eroding, uh, they allow soft sediment to build up uh, keeping it from getting washed away in currents. And that soft sediment is great for living things to burrow in, many of them. Uh, many critters will hide in the seagrasses um, or swim around them, as you see with all these fish here. Uh, here we've got some seahorses from the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, seahorses are adapted to living in seagrass beds. You can see them coiling their tails around handy uh, seagrass stems. There's hundreds of species that eat them, uh, everything from small whales to manatees. Uh, manatees, by the way, belong to a group of mammals called the Serenians. Um, we have Florida manatees, and then in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, uh, there's this thing called the dugong. Uh, we used to have stellar sea cow um, up in um, the Aleutian Islands, but that one has gone extinct. Uh, but all of these feed on seagrass, and because they're so productive, they're very good at absorbing carbon dioxide. About 10% of the CO2 uptake in the oceans is taken up by seagrass meadows. That's a habitat that's very much worth preserving uh, because of their ability to withstand uh, erosion. Uh, they're important in coastal protection, um, you know, protection of the coastlines from damage caused by storm winds, which is something that's kind of on my mind right now because Hurricane Delta is hitting South Louisiana. Uh, Fortunately, my parents are far enough inland that I don't think they're going to uh, get hit too badly, but we'll see. Right. And then in addition to seagrass beds, we've got mangroves. Uh, these tend to be tropical. Uh, they're small trees in 16 different plant families. Um, all mangroves are not related to each other. Uh, this type of life has evolved convergently in many unrelated lineages. 
and they're small trees that can grow with roots submerged in brackish or salt water. Uh, so there's a bunch right there. Many of them have root cell layers with a um, thick layer of suberin. Uh, that's a water-resistant lipid that also is what makes cork uh, watertight. Uh, the suberin blocks salt from entering the plant, so the roots can go in and not be killed by high salt concentrations. And if that's not enough, many mangroves can excrete salt directly. Uh, so the lower left, you can see a mangrove leaf uh, with salt crystals building up on it. Uh, so very well adapted for where they live. That picture was taken a few years ago when we went to the uh, the Tampa Bay metro area uh, to a place called San Pete Beach, where my wife's uh, uncle is a real estate tycoon. And we took that at a retirement community where my wife's grandmother was living at the time. And that's a little stand of mangroves. Uh, what you can't see is that it's pretty much completely surrounded by sandy beach and fishing pier and parking lot and uh, tacky t-shirt shop and things like that. Uh, an awful lot of the communities around Tampa Bay are built on what used to be mangroves uh, that got uh, destroyed. Uh, some of that bay, the wetlands were filled in and used for building houses and retirement communities and sorry i don't know if anybody is from florida or has family that lives there but um my wife's grandmother used to say that florida was fit for two kinds of people the newly wed and the nearly dead all right anyway so a lot of mangroves have, you know, mangroves like this used to line all of Tampa Bay pretty much. And a lot of those were destroyed for development. In Southeast Asia, the culprit is often aquaculture, uh, in particular farming shrimp. Uh, you can, dang it. Uh, sorry, I've got a uh, cat climbing on the keys. Uh, Sorry, I think after we're done, I'm going to have to make a hat out of this cat. That might calm him down. Anyway, uh, shrimp farming is, you can basically fence off an entire bay and turn it into a shrimp farm. And this is the source for an awful lot of shrimp uh, that's exported. Uh, there's a lot of Asian shrimp in uh, the supermarket now. Sorry, wrestling a cat again. And unfortunately, developing these bays for shrimp farming has destroyed a lot of mangroves. And that's a concern because mangroves are also very good at protecting coastlines from storm surges. Mangroves are also major ecosystem engineers. Uh, those roots, like the roots of seagrass, tend to trap soft sediment. Uh, they keep it from eroding away. Uh, they protect coastlines from storm surges, and they provide habitat for many other species. Uh, these are mangrove roots at low tide uh, covered with oysters. And as of 2017, it was estimated that as a direct result of mangrove loss, three and a half million people globally uh, were estimated to be at risk, uh, mostly from storm damage and things like that. All right, and that's what I got for you today. Um, sorry, I've got a persistent cat that won't leave me alone, and he's kind of messing with my game. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. <laughs>